So let's start this demo off initially by modeling a pet, yeah, a simple pet. So what I'm going to do is we're going to create this class on the outside so that when we compile it, it creates a dynamic link library or DLL. So let's go ahead and create one. So I'm going to do a new project here. And within the project, the first thing that I want to do is I've just installed Visual Studio 2017, and I'd like to use the class diagram. Now, looking through here, I don't see the class diagram available. If you don't have the class diagram available, then what you can do is walk through these steps. So I went ahead and I clicked Open Visual Studio Installer. Once installer opens up, I'm going to click up here on individual components. And by the way, the class diagram prior to version 2017 was automatically installed. And I'm told for some students, and I'm not sure what the rationale is or why, but it does install. It could be because you had an earlier version of Visual Studio on your computer. I'm not absolutely sure. But it did install on this computer, and I certainly did have a, an earlier version. So let's go ahead and do individual components, and then I'm going to work my way down here until I get to code tools and look what's right at the very top class designer I'm gonna go ahead and click that goes ahead and adds the class diagrammer you'll see it over here working a little bit and then I'm gonna click modify so as it turns out it took about 15 minutes for me to do the install about 8 gigabytes is what it reported had to download and install so it took a lot longer than I had originally anticipated and while that was going on I thought a little bit about some of the issues that were coming up of why some people were seeing the class diagram and why some weren't and it could be because I'm using as well as in the classroom or using a community version and perhaps that's the lowest end application that they have in Visual Studio and perhaps the community version doesn't have it because I do have a lot of students that either went out and downloaded the Pro or the Enterprise version of Visual Studio and perhaps that's where the difference lies. But nonetheless, we know how to go back in and do the install. It takes me back to this screen. I'm going to go ahead and close it out. And by the way, one of the things that it did do while the install was going on is it shut down my Visual Studio in the background and started back up again. So let's go ahead and close this out jump back over I'm gonna do a file new project and what we're gonna do again is we're prototyping a pet so we're going to come through and decide what properties we would decide to put in a particular pet object so the first thing I'm gonna do is create a class library uh, ultimately what we want to do is the reason we're doing a class library again is that that's going to generate a dynamic link library and then I could use this dynamic link library anywhere just like we would use tools for example that we might put into a DLL and use it on our applications we've covered that in the previous lecture before the class library generates a DLL I've got a folder I've created out there already on my drive C called inheritance uh, I'm gonna go ahead and simply call this pet of course what's going to end up happening out of here is it's going to create a namespace called pet and inside the pet it's going to have a class and that class is probably going to be called class one let's take a look and see what happens when it creates it yes it did class one is the name so first thing I want to do is come back over here and I'm going to rename this pet now don't get confused again between the namespace and the name of the class. Think of the namespace as a filing cabinet. And I'm going to go ahead and click yes here so it changes class 1 here. So think of namespace as a filing cabinet where all the programs, all the classes are connected together within that filing cabinet. It's very easy for all the programs to interact with each other within the filing cabinet. Outside of that filing cabinet though, a little bit more difficult. And when you create a solution, the solution name in this case was pet and I went ahead and called the class pet as well next thing I like to do I think is to go back in and add that class diagram so let's do a right click here add new item here there it is right here class diagram now of course as we talked about before class diagram is one of those strange tools that we can add to our project and we can delete it anytime and put it back in without losing anything all it is is a tool that allows us to design a class 
does the infrastructure for properties and methods and field variables or helper variables. That's all it does. You do not have to have the class diagram to do what I'm going to do. My job is to show you as many shortcuts as possible with you understanding exactly what that shortcut is doing. So I'm going to go ahead and add it in. And now here's my class diagram. Next thing I'm going to do is grab my pet class and drag it over the class diagram. So now that I've got the pet class in the class diagram, I can go back in and start adding features that I think belong to a pet. So I'm gonna, not going to be overly creative here, uh, but I'm going to do this only for demonstration purposes. So let's go ahead and start off with some basic designs. First thing I want to do is add a new property, and I think every pet's going to start off with a name. So let's call it pet name. And the reason I'm calling it pet name as opposed to name is name may cause some problems later with other objects. I try to avoid using name by itself, although you've seen me use it before. If there's any issue, IntelliSense will tell me about it. I'm going to add another property. and So I'm basically going to add in birth date, type, the food they want, and the sex of the pet. So let's add in another property. Birth date. And I'm going to go back after I finish here and change the data types on it because I haven't been doing that as we're going along here. Next thing I'm going to add in is the type. What kind of pet is it? Okay, so we'll add in a property. Type. I want to know is it a dog, is it a cat, is it an iguana? What kind of food does my pet have? And then the last thing I think I want to add in is the sex of the pet. Now after I get those added in, I'm going to start from top to bottom, walk over to here to my properties, and declare each one of these as a data type. So I'm down a little bit low here. Notice what it did is it put all my properties in alphabetical order. I'm not sure if there is any way of overriding that. I wish it would put it in the order that I have it, but nonetheless, I can change it in the code if I want to. First thing is a birth date. That's going to be not of type integer, as you see over on the right-hand side, but I'm going to come back in and call it a date time. I wish that over here they had IntelliSense that would pop up, but they don't, so you have to make sure you type in the data type correctly or you're going to get an error. Next thing is food. That's going to be of type string. The pet name is also going to be of type string. The sex will be string. And then, of course, the last one is type, and that will also be of type string. Now, I'm going to keep it simple. I could go back in here and make this far more complicated because I need to make sure that sex, for example, might be male, female, neutered male, spay female, unknown. Type could be a variety of different things. And what I might want to do is go back in there and create classes to control the different data that's going to be put in. But that's not the purpose of this lecture. The purpose of this lecture is to take a look at inheritance. So let's take a look at the pet class that's been generated for us thus far. And you'll notice that it's got a brand new structure inside of here for generating classes than version 2015 did of Visual Studio. So the very first thing I want to do is come back in here and uh, I'm going to close my window out. It's giving me all these errors. And I think the very first step I want to do is go back in and start creating my field or my helper variables. So I'll do that right below the class. Because remember now, in this particular case, my input is going to be pet name as a property, but I want to capture it down in my getters and setters down below as variables. First thing I'm going to do, I'll use a different technique than I've used before. Some people will choose to use an underscore. So I'm going to put an underscore in here. I'm going to call it pet name. Of course, I better give it a data type over here, string. So the first thing I need to do is go back in and set my helper variables. And I'll do so at the very top of the program. Again, i got to match each one of these. And remember now that the helper variable is that variable that is used to actually store all the values. Pet name is a property, and that just means that it's being passed through that portal pet name, and I need to capture it in a variable, and that's what the getters and setters are for. So that should be a little bit of a review there. So let's go ahead and do string. And I'll use an underscore this time around to indicate my helper variables. There's a lot of different techniques. I've seen 
uh, case differences. I've seen O's in front of them. I've seen M's in front of them. As long as you're consistent, that is fine. Of course, it's going to be up to your team leader. So first thing I want to do is pet name. And of course, date time, and that's going to be underscore birth date. Now my next step will be to go down below here and fill in my getters and setters. I'll do the first two as an example, and not to waste your time, I'll jump ahead and show you them filled in already, and we can continue on a little bit quicker. So inside my getter and setters, I'm going to use it the traditional way. These are generating errors. It lets me put the program in there. They expect me to replace this code. So I'm going to go ahead and replace it with my getter and setter. We're looking at this from the perspective of the user. So what does the user do? The user wants to get the value back. So they're going to be asking me to re return back the helper variable for this. So that's going to be underscore pet name. Now if I want, I have a setter here and the setter then has to come back in and populate underscore pet name. So let's do that. Pet name is equal to, and we're going to use the keyword value here. And you recall the value just says if I come back in there and I've instantiated this object and it's called my pet dot pet name, the moment that I pass a value to that, the object's going to receive it as value, and this value will be of that same data type, and it's going to populate underscore pet name here. Let's do the second one and this is a little bit different. This is a birth date in here. So we're going to do our getters and setters here. Just like that. And there's not a lot difference. The only difference is now we're going to be dealing with a date and time which is a little bit more tricky to deal with. But we've all dealt with those already. So let's go ahead and return back underscore birth date and we're going to set underscore birth date is going to be equal to value. So now I'm going to jump ahead, pause the recording right now, finish the rest of these up and we'll come back in and continue on. I've now completed the basic class. I've added a couple of methods as well so let's just take a look at what I've got here. First thing I need to do now that I got it complete is go back in and one of the last things you do is remove and sort usings. Here I've got a couple of different properties that we set up. I've got pet name. I've created a helper variable for that. I've got birth date. I've also got a helper variable for that as well all the way down. Birth date is date time. I've got a type which is string. I've got a food which is of type string. I've got a sex property also which is of type string. And then what I've done is I've created two different methods down below and I've added an additional command that we haven't seen so far. So the first thing I did is I created a private method and I decided I want to do all the calculations in my private method and I call this calc days and what it does is it accepts an argument of a birth date and what I'd like to do is determine how many days between the birth date and today there are. First thing I do is I receive an argument birth date. It's got to be of date time. I then take date time. I got a variable called end date and end date is made equal to date time dot today. That is a constant that we have out there. Eh, technically not a constant because the constant doesn't change in values, but it is an object out there, date time, that we can pull a date time dot today or date time dot now to get information out. So I'm just going to move that into end date. And then my formula says return the end date minus the, our birth date. And once you calculate that, return that just in total days. And total days happens to be a date time method that when I'm dealing with date times here, I put parentheses around it, I hit a period, um, I'm going to get some additional properties returned back to me or additional methods available to me that are only within that date time data type. Notice that this is private and what I'm trying to do here is I'm trying to emulate that concept that all your work is done in a private variable and then getting to that private data happens in a public variable or I should say a public method. So up above here now, I have my public method. 
There's a new keyword we'll talk about in just a moment. It's called virtual. But my method is public string get pet info. So notice what it expects. It expects that it's going to return of type string. Let's forget the fact that this virtual is here. It's going to return of type string. The name of the method is get pet info. And again, the signature says there's no parameters being passed in because everything I need is already contained. I have access to it within this given class. So what I'm trying to do now is I'm using a string.format. If you don't understand the string.format command, it's an exceptionally cool command. I do have a strings lecture out there you could take a look at. And I talk about the string.format command, but it's a way to put a string together much easier than doing concatenation. And I'll explain it briefly here. Uh, what we've got is we've got a primary argument, which is the string that you want to have plugged information into. So I wanted to say pet, and then I want to say the number of days old the pet is. So what I do is I put a placeholder in here, and for every piece of data that I want to be plugged into this string, I put a different placeholder starting at zero. And in this particular instance, there's only going to be one argument in this string, and that's zero. So as soon as that string's over, I put a comma in here, and it then takes this piece of information right here, determines what it is, and it plugs it in to this argument location right here. It is a cool command. It works in not only in console applications, in web applications. It works across the board. It's a very common uh, command that I would suggest if you don't use it, you get used to using it. It's a great one. Now, notice what I'm doing inside here. I've got this method, and I'm calling down below calc days. So the work is really going to be done in calc days. I'm passing down to calc days the birth date. Now, technically, I didn't even need to pass down the birth date because I had access to the birth date down here anyway as a variable. But I did it just as a demonstration here. Again, remember, I could have gotten rid of this and just referred to that. It's already in my scope. Let's go ahead and see how this object works. Oh, before I go on, I need to explain one item. As I build these classes, if I ever anticipate that there's a possibility that down the road somebody's going to want to extend this object and perhaps overload an existing object. They might want to change what get pet info means. To, in order to allow that to happen, virtual is placed here, which means that it's allowing later for get pet info to be subclassed and again to be extended. Notice down here it doesn't matter because I'll never have access to calc days outside of this class right here. So now let's go back over and take a look at the test application that I put together. So before I go on, I'm going to go ahead and build this just to make sure. As soon as I build it, it's going to tell me the location of where it's put. So there, right there at the bottom of the screen is the location of where my pet DLL is. And again, notice that the pet, the name of the DLL takes on the same name as the namespace up here. It's not getting the name from this. It's getting the name from right here. It's worked out well. Let's jump over to the test application. So I'm at my test application right now. Notice I've already got it filled in a bit. Let's go ahead and take a look at what I did. First thing I had to do is come back over here because this is a different project and I had to add into this project, do a right click, add references, went back in, I browsed, found the pet DLL here. That's interesting that's staying on the screen. Found the pet DLL and I added it in. So now it exists inside of my references, which means those commands are now available to me. I want to go ahead and I need to instantiate that pet object. A couple of ways I could do it. I chose the long way. I went in here and said, let's take the right off the namespace, dot the class name. And again, that popped up in IntelliSense. Watch this. Pet dot pet. So it dropped up, it popped off in IntelliSense. If I didn't want to do that, if I wanted to take a shortcut, and I think it's giving me that hint here, isn't it? Nope. So what I could have done is I could have come back in here and said using pet. In the moment that I did that, I would not have had to place this pet at the beginning of it. I could have simply gone back in there and completed it like that. But I'm going to go ahead and leave it longwise. I like that better. At this point in time, I'm instantiating a brand new pet object. 
I'm going to call it my pet. And the moment that I do that, I inherit in this new object all the characteristics of my pet, which includes the pet name, the birth date, the food, the sex, whatever properties that we put in that. So that's exactly what I did. I instantiated my pet and I started setting properties. My pet dot pet name is equal to Reagan. My pet dot birth date is equal to, and since birth date of time is of date time, I went ahead and created a date and I cast it using the parse command back into a date time, which let me plug it directly in. I've got my pet dot food is equal to four cups. I've got my pet dot sex is equal to male, M for male. And then what I've done down below is to show you that I can get to my pet methods. Let me just open this up and prove it. I've got dot here. Um, I can get down to my pet dot pet name. I can get down to any of the methods that I had here. There's my get pet info as we had before. Just close it off. And let's go ahead and test this out and make sure it works. So if everything works correctly, I would expect it to produce back the information we had in my pet. And it did. Pet, 13, 12 days old. So that part worked pretty well. This should have been a review for us from previous, but now we're going to dive in to something brand new. Let's go ahead and close this out. Now let's go back to our previous class and let's assume at this point that we need to have a different type of pet. What we would like to do is really to create a dog object. Now I could go back in from scratch and create a brand new dog object if I wanted to, or I could subclass that dog object out because really a dog is a subclass of a pet. When I say subclass, a subset would probably be a better terminology. In order to do that, I've got a variety of different ways I could do it because I've got access to this pet class here, this DLL. I could actually come back over to the, to the using application. I, I could put this pretty much anywhere. I could go back to my test application here, create another class on the inside of this and use this pet and subclass it right here. I'm going to do it the simple way or the easier way right now. The rest of it will fall into place. Let's jump back to the object over here. I'm going to add in at this point underneath the pet namespace, do a right click here and I'm going to add in a new class right here. And this time I want my class to be the dog class. And I'm going to show you something unbelievable here. Just a second. Click add. I get my new dog class and now what I'd really like to do is I want to make the dog class a subclass of the pet class. Why would I want to do that? I want to inherit in this dog class all the characteristics that have already been created in that pet class. And here's all I have to do. I'm going to go right to the end of this class dog statement. I'm going to put a colon in and then I'm going to put in the name of the parent class or the base class if you will. So in this case it's going to be pet. And now, at this point in time, I've now taken the dog class, I've subclassed it from the pet class, and I've got all those properties that the dog class has. Now, you'd never want to stop at this point. Why? Well, because you would just normally want to use the pet class. If you didn't make any changes to it, then what you've got is what you've got. But really, what we want to do now is we want to go back in there and do some additional changes in that dog class. So the first thing I want to do is extend out the dog class a little bit. So I'm going to go back to my class diagram. And again, remember, the stuff that I'm doing in my class diagram, I could be coding by hand. I'm using it because it does some of the work for me, and that, you know, is my methodology. I'm going to do a right click over here. And notice the relationship. Automatically, once I subclass it out, it sees that there's a parent-child relationship between the dog and the pet. So if I go ahead right now and I do a right click on dog, I can add in properties. So the first property that I want to add in is dog breed. And as long as I'm here, I'm going to come down below and turn it into a type string. We're going to assume our dog has a dog chip. Add in a property. And I'm going to call it my ID chip. And that's going to be of integer, so I'll leave it a go exactly as it is. And we'll leave those as our two additional properties that we're going to add into the dog class. Now, in addition to the dog class, let's go back in and let's make some changes to it. I've got to do a little bit of cleanup here. So just as we did before, I have to add in some helper variables up here. 
So the helper variable I'm going to put together, I'll do exactly what I did before. I'll have a string dog breed. And then, of course, the last one we'll put in is int. So int underscore id chip. And, of course, it'll only work if I'm careful on my case. Now I'm going to jump forward here and do my getters and setters. Now return dog breed here. And we will set dog breed down below. And we'll do the last with the ID chip here. So we've got our basic properties set up right now. I'd like to create some new methods is I want to change that original pet method that we had over here and remember in order for me to be able to change it I have to add in this keyword virtual that is the only thing that will allow it to be subclassed out if I have another public method here I could access the public method from the child but I couldn't overwrite it I want to have the ability to overwrite it and this doesn't change anything if I was to instantiate this object by itself but again it does make it so that later if I come back in I can do this. The next step is to create a new public method and in order to do this kind of public method I have to put a keyword in here to tell it I want to override the original one of the parent object. So if I'm overriding a method of the parent I have to use override. It has to be specified as virtual. So at this point I'm going to return of type string. I'm going to call this method again get pet info very interesting how it fills in the return base get pet info for me because what it's doing is it's assuming that if I call get pet info, it's going to return back the parent's pet get info automatically. And notice that if I want to reference the parent object or any method or property in the parent object, I can use this base dot to get to it. But that's not what we're going to want to do in this point. We actually don't want to call the parent. We want to go back in and, and totally overwrite it as we mentioned up here. Is this guy's going to call back a method that I'm going to have as private and by the magic of computer I can paste in this other method that I would like to use. And the method I'm using here is going to be called get dog years. And it's a brand new method. So since it's a brand new method it's going to extend the dog class. And what I'm doing in here is basically I've got a formula that calculates dog years and it's based on whatever today's date is and the birth date of the dog. First year is equal to 15 years and then every year thereafter is equal to three years. And this is basically a formula that I put together that does that. One thing you might note within this is that I've got two total days here and you would expect total days which is a method that belongs to a date class you would expect dot total days to come back in and return back integers but in fact it returns back of type double so once I figure out how many days old the pet is I divide that by 365 to get the number of years but again it's as a double so I have to pass it use the pass through method integer to get into an integer of int total years and that's how many years old the dog is and then I want to calculate that as dog years and I simply use this formula down below and return it. Again notice this is a private method. Private method because I don't need to get to it on the outside or maybe I don't want anybody to get to it on the outside. I just want it to be internal for internal calculations. So let's go back up here and modify this get pet info here so it is a little bit meaningful and it actually is an override of the original. So what I want to do is have it come back in here and let's just do a return and I'm going to do a string dot format. I love this command. And what I'd like it to say is something to the extent of uh, pet name is 
x number dog years old. So let's go ahead and write that formula out. So I'm going to put my quotation marks in here, and I'm, my first played hold placeholder will be the pet's name, and then is. My second argument will be the pet's age and dog years, and I'll go ahead and put that down. Dog years old. After which, that's the statement I want to have print out. I need to pass the arguments in. What am I going to fill in for this first argument? Zero. Um, I think what I'd like to do is simply go back in and fill in the pet's name that we've uh, grabbed. Now, if I type in pet name, you'll see that it pops up just like that. And where did pet's name come from? Actually, I'm not sure if I trust this as being the pet's name. I'm going to go ahead and make sure it's grabbing the correct pet's name out. In order to do that, I'm going to type in base. And when I type in base, what it's doing is it's referencing the base class, the base class or the original class that was created, the parent class. And there it sees pet name, so I'm guaranteed that that's the correct pet name. I could have probably gone through and tested the other one out, but I know this one right here is going to work. Now the next thing I want to do is plug in for this first argument, get dog ears. So let's go ahead and do that. Let's do get dog ears. And get dog ears in this case doesn't need to have anything passed into it. In fact, notice down here on the signature down below here, there is nothing being passed in at all. So I'm doing my get dog ears here. And then afterwards, I need to make sure that I put it into a format can be accepted up here. So I'm going to do a dot to string on that because remember, it's returning back an integer and I'm passing it into a string region right here. So let's just make a to string method here. And then I'm going to go ahead and close this out. Now again, oh, and let's spell everything out correctly here. And let me just glance this over and make sure we understand what's going on. Had original get pet info from the base class, which was that pet class. I'm overriding that. I'm telling it I don't want to use that original one. I now want to overwrite it with this new, this new return value here, which is a string dot format, which returns back Fido is 33 dog years old, for example. Down below, where does it get the dog years old? I'm calling a private method that nobody will see on the outside. Once I instantiate this object, this dog object, there will be no reference whatsoever to get dog years. So I think next step is to go ahead and build it. Oh, but before I do that, I did recognize I made one error before, and that is I want to do is make sure that I make my dog class public, which it is here. And I don't think I did that originally. And then I like to come back in here and clean it up just a little bit. So I think my uh, remove and sort using statements will work up really well. That's nice and clean. Let's go ahead and let's see if the pet class is the same way. It's all been cleaned up as well. And let's go ahead and build it. Make sure we have no errors in here. We've already created a test application before. I should not have to go back in and reference this new object. It should automatically reference it because it's in the same domain. But had I been doing this on one computer in one domain and say somebody else across the internet wanted a copy of my DLL, I would have to just provide them with this DLL right here and every time I make a change to it, I would have to then notify them. Provide them with the pet DLL. They would have to remove the previous reference and then go back in and add in the new DLL. But since this is in the same development environment and exactly on the same computer anyway, there's that relationship that's made where it knows where the specific test app is located at and it knows where the specific DLL is located. So the moment that the DLL is updated, it goes back in and generally updates the test app. So let's go ahead and do that, jump over the test app and take a look at it. So we're back at our test application now. This is the one where we were testing out that pet class. And let's go ahead and make sure we run it and it's still functioning, that we haven't damaged anything. And again, it's still working. So let me close that out. And what I want to do now is go back in and instantiate this new subclass, and I want to do it in the same application so we can get a feel for both of them. So let's do that. Pet dot, and now notice that when I do pet dot, I get a dog. And I'm going to go ahead and call that dog my dog equals a new pet dog. And I want to point out that the part of doing this aspect right here should now be making sense to everybody based on the previous lessons that we've had. Simply doing 
dog, my dog, sets aside the adequate amount of memory in order to hold the object, but it doesn't move in all those properties and all those methods that we had created. By doing this aspect of it right here, it tells it two things. It says, go back in and add in all of the properties and methods of the pet object, and at the same time, run the constructor if the constructor exists. So I've already got some of this code created so you don't have to sit there and painfully watch me type it out. So I'm going to go ahead and paste it in here. And let's take a look at what this code is doing a little bit. So I've got where I just instantiated the dog or my dog object. And now I'm going back in and plugging information in. Notice the difference here. I will still in this program running still have access to my pet. But now I'm adding a my dog in. And you'll notice right down the line here, most everything that existed up here, I can add down below as my dog. That's the inherited information. But in addition to that, I added in a dog breed, which is a St. Bernard. I went ahead and added in a dog chip. And let's go ahead and take a look at this run. Because it's very important to understand that we could have had this very, very complex pet object. And we just wanted to make a few minor changes and create this dog object. It, that is not very difficult and you don't have to reinvent that entire pet to do it. So let's test this out. So it says pet is 1,313 days old. I hit the space bar and it says Roscoe is 39 dog years old. I'm going to go ahead and take all this code right here and the beauty behind this is the reusability without having to reinvent anything. So I'm going to copy this code, paste it down below here I'm going to highlight everything that I've got inside here right now. And because I'm a lazy typist, I'm going to do a find and replace. Replace everything that says my dog with your dog. Boom. Click OK. Now I go back in here and I'm going to fill a little bit of different information in. Fido. He's a poodle. Uh, he was born in 2010. Month. He probably eats about one cup of food per day. And Fido is a strange name for a female dog. And Fido has a chip of five, six, seven. So let's go ahead and run this. And there's the first one. The pet is 13, 13 days old. Roscoe is 39 dog years old. And Fido is 33 dog years old. Notice how simple that was. Before we dive into our final demonstration, I'd like to go back in and show you one additional feature that we haven't talked about yet or if I did talk about it, I talked about it briefly, and that is the ability to go back in and change the parent class and have that work its way down through the inheritance. So let's go ahead and jump over to the other application, the class app. And this time, I'm inside the dog class. I'm going to open up the pet class again. And inside the pet class, I'm going to add additional property. We could do this in a diagrammer. And by the way, I want to show you something here. <clears throat> I'm going to go ahead and delete this diagram out. And then I'm going to go back in and add it in again. I'm going to throw the objects back on. Throw the pet back on again. Throw the dog back on again. I can go back in now to, let's go to the pet class. And in the pet class, I want to add in a new property. And I want that property that I'm adding back in. And by the way, this shows you that that class diagram is not an essential component of your application that you can delete it out and add it back in at will. That owner is going to be over here of type string. Click it. Let's go back over to the pet class. And I should find the owner property in here. Here it is. Let's put our getters and setters in. So first thing I'll do is come back over here and add in a new string. Owner. Come down to my properties. Do my getters and setters.
So every pet has an owner. And that's going to be equal to value here. I'm going to rebuild this entire project. Notice I went to the base class to do this. Let's build it. Make sure there's no errors. Said there were no errors on it. We should be able now to jump back over to our test application that we've created. In either one of these two objects, I should have access to owner. Let's take a look and see that's true. Let me jump right down here and say, my pet dot owner is equal to Fred. And I should do my pet here. And then down below, same thing. I can show you that it's also been inherited in my dog. Owner is equal to Jane. Some very, very, very powerful things. Now, you may not see the overall value in something as simple as this. Wait a moment, and let's get into this next demonstration. I'll show you how a little bit more practical approach could be used. In this demonstration, I want to show you how I can subclass a text box control, add a public method to the new text box child class, compile it, and add it back to my toolbox to be instantiated through drag and drop. So what I've done on the screen right now is I've added a brand new class, or I've opened up a brand new class. To do that, it was a new solution. I called it new text box, added an empty class to it, and now from that empty class, I've gone back in and added this. The name of the new class is new text box, and by putting a colon here and adding text box at the end, I'm asking that it inherit all of the features of the text box. Now, this is one of those few controls that requires me to have to go back in and place partial here. Uh, and partial is because it wants to use the initializer to go back in and build the screen. And part of that initializer will restrict a little bit of what I can do right now. In this example, what I want to do is subclass text box in a new text box and I'm going to add a method and the method is simply going to count the number of words that exist in that text box at the time this method is executed. It's going to split the text box by spaces and if you take the number of spaces that are in a phrase you're going to come up with one less than a number of words. So I add one to that and I'm returning that value. So it's a pretty simple step to go through. I, again, I have to put partial up here. Let's go ahead and build it and make sure everything works okay. Now I've already created a test application. Let's jump back over and take a look at it. One of the problems with what I'm doing right now, and this, again, this is a Windows Forms test application, is I happen to be running my demonstrations on a UHD or ultra high definition 4K monitor. It happens to be an Alienware laptop. And as at the time that I'm recording this, Microsoft doesn't have a solution why we're not able to go back in and do Windows Forms on it, although there's always been talk about changes and workarounds. It's an interesting situation because most of the problems that are occurring, at least that are being reported to occur, are occurring on the new Microsoft Surface computers and the Surface computers are also UHD 4K monitors so I'm sure Microsoft's going to have to do something pretty soon and what that does is that causes a bit of distortion in the Windows Forms. It, you cannot go back in right now and write a Windows Forms application in a monitor like I've got here. You'll have to go back in and if you want to use that you'll have to get a secondary monitor make that your primary monitor during development one that is lower than a 4K, develop on that, and when you're done, reset your primary monitor back to your tablet or your computer. Let's go ahead and take a look at what I've got here. First thing that I want to do is add this as a tool to my toolbox. So I'm going to open up my toolbox. For right now, I'm going to go ahead and pin it, and I'm going to do a right click and choose items. The difference between these two areas over here as far as adding a reference versus choosing items is choosing items will add the reference on my behalf and add the tool to the toolbar whereas adding references simply adds the reference. I'm going to go ahead and choose items. It's going to take a moment. I'm going to browse. 
locate where that new text box is and I'm going to open it, add it in. And then when I'm done, click OK. And if I did everything correctly, and notice I've created this form in advance. I wish that's what the form would look like when I run it, but it won't. And there's my new text box control. Now, had I gone back in originally, there's a lot of little things I could have done with that new text box control. If I wanted to play around with foreground color and background color, I'd have to investigate a little bit more of the paint. And the paint method is what allows you to go back in and design the screens. That's outside the scope again of this class. I'm going to simply grab that and drag it on and let it instantiate for me. And that's the great advantage of this. Had I gone back in and simply added that tool over on the right hand side, I could have added the toolbox by hand, uh, gone back in, set the height, the width, gone back in and set the location on the screen. But the whole idea of having this toolbar ready with the forms controller is the ability to drag and drop and have it build those basics for you. So here is the text box. It's created new text box one. I'm going to leave it right that for test purposes. I've already got some code developed. Let's take a look at what we've got out here. First thing is, is I have my form one constructor and keep in mind why is that constructor here? The constructor is there because that's what goes back and builds the form. That's what executes that code on the other part of the partial class which is that code behind. So now down below here I am testing to see if that text box length, if the information in the text box is greater than zero. That's necessary because there's actually a bug inside of the split method. What the split method does is it returns back the number of spaces that might exist. If no spaces come back, it should either return back zero or a null. It actually returns back an array or a list of one item which is empty. So I have to work around that just a little bit. And that took a little bit of time to figure out where that mistake was. So in order to, to get around that, I do a new text box one dot text and I take the length of that. I could have also said dot text equals quote quote or greater than quote quote I should say and that also would have worked but this is a little bit cleaner I think. So if the length or the number of characters typed in that text box are greater than zero then what I wanted to do is to go back in and run that word count method that I've added to new text box and so let's just prove that that works. And there's a lot of value in this before I go on folks because there's a lot of controls that you're going to start using and you're going to want to modify over and over again and you're going to realize that had you gone back originally and changed that, created your own, thrown that in a toolbox perhaps, you would have saved an enormous amount of time. Let's run this. Now, so that's what happens. I've got a lot of space on this guy. So I'm going to type in, now is the time. How many words are in there? Four words. Number of words. Eight. So I've now got a text box that has a method in it that's different than that parent text box. But the fact of the matter is, this text box is a child of this text box. But they're independent right now. I could distribute this new text box control without having that text box control present once it's sent to a DLL.